Today is Tuesday, April 11th, and you're listening to the Beer Temple Podcast. Remember this is what we wanted. Remember this is what we said. To never be heard and seen from again, 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 again. Remember this is what we wanted. Remember this is what we said. To never be heard and seen from again, 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 again. To the Beer Temple podcast. I am your co host, Mike Shalau from Is Was Brewing, and I'm here with your other co host, Chris Quinn of the Beer Temple. Chris, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good. I'm getting, getting over a little bit of a little chest cold thing. But. Okay. I'm getting over a little bit of a subpar fade for the first time in, in Ooh, memory. Wow. Honestly. He's throwing him under the bus. I mean, it wasn't even on the recording. I, mean, <laughs> I just got to say. We're going back to old school times. I would just throw, <laughs> if, if, if old heads remember, <laughs> it's really just, it's just cyclical. Yeah, it's right. It's just cyclical. We're back, baby. We're back. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it was jarring. It, it was, you know. You guys won't hear it. You guys will feel, will hear just a butter fade, a classic right. perfect fade. Uh, but, you know, the well, rawness, the realness that we experienced <laughs> When you get something that I'm gonna be probably waking up screaming about in the middle of the night. <laughs> when you get so used to like elite level performances day in and day out from someone, and then there's just like a a jarring, right. uh, <clears throat> mediocre, right. But it was middle school JV level fade. Yeah, well, I don't. I feel like we're ragging on him too hard. I mean, hey, you you don't think he's thinking about that himself? You don't I, think he's putting himself through worse? We all know. The, the Fade Master's worst cr- critic is yeah, himself. Is himself. Yeah. yeah, he stays up all night mm-hmm. going over the fades. Going over the fade. First one in, last one out of the fade gym. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Putting in the work. Yeah, exactly. Doing the reps. Exactly. Mamba mentality. Fade Mamba. Yeah, the fade Mamba. <laughs> <laughs> Rest uh, in peace. Yeah. So anyway, anyway, doing a show. We're doing a show. We got a show going on. <laughs> I'm doing well. We were uh, celebrating uh, uh, beer, beer fits, mm-hmm. friend of the show, mm-hmm. uh, multiple time guest of the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, you chose not to imbibe any alcohol at that event. That's true. I went the other route. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we'll see how this show goes. Yeah. Uh, and then I just had the furthest ate a apart huge we've been to start a show in a long time in uh, noodles uh, right beforehand. So I've got a huge gut bomb sitting on top of it. And uh, you're in for a great here show. Here we everyone. are. <laughs> here we are. Um, got a good show. Uh, I think I'm, I've got high hopes. Great guests. Hopefully, we don't ruin it. Yes, exactly. Should we just. Get into it, or is there any kind of uh, comings and goings that Ooh, we should? We like talk to thank the listeners. Yeah. WLPN. I forget the numbers, but you know, one zero five five. One zero five five. That's a yep. that's a toughie. Uh, and yeah. uh, they're fearless leaders. Well, mm-hmm. Jamie, Jamie, Ed, Ed, the other fearless leaders. However, whoever else is fearlessly leading them now. Yeah. Uh, but but mostly the listeners. Yeah. You're, if you're on the radio or whatever your podcast. Uh, streamer of choices. Exactly. So uh, rate and review the podcast. Why don't rate you and review. Hey, we haven't. Yeah, even, we haven't said that in about six years. We haven't said that in about six years. Haven't looked at the reviews on iTunes. Smash that like button. Smash the like button. Mm-hmm. Subscribe, subscribe if that's still a thing. <laughs> uh-huh. And if you leave a review, uh, make sure it's good. Make sure it's well. Make sure it has at least an inside joke. Mm. Yeah. Better, more important to me than good or bad reviews mm-hmm. are inside jokes. That's what the algorithm that, cares that about. The, yeah. Well, that's what <laughs> my many, algorithm. How many cares zombie about. dust jokes? You can like, fit oh yeah, I remember that characters. from the third year of the of the show. <laughs> yeah, that little. No one's nugget. talked about the hovercraft in a long time. Exactly, bejeweled hovercrafts. Exactly. So that's what I want to see in the reviews. Oh man, we got a four point nine. 
Nice. Who gave us a one? Oh, someone gave us a one? Good. Probably Michael Kaiser. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be real. It was Michael Kaiser. Or that little to toady be. that runs his forum, or used to anyway. <laughs> that guy. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, this is a good one from a year ago. The Allagash White of Pods, three stars. <laughs> <laughs> that's see, that is a perfect example of a perfect review. Oh, the Allagash White of Pods, three stars. That was Joe Wagner, what's up, Joseph? Yeah. So we don't need to literally scroll <laughs> through Surge's iPhone <laughs> to read reviews, especially ones from years ago. But we can we can move on. We have a show. Um, we have a, a a bit of a round table, but not really. But we're here to talk about. Uh, some BS. Actually, the person who gave us one star, their name is Jake. Oh, for real? Yeah, it says tons of dead time, um, uh, you know, like, and long silences. Uh, and the title of the review is under edited. <laughs> Can't nice. argue with that. that well, is, uh, um, <laughs> like, the thing, like, um, so the thing is with that, uh, yeah, Jake, that was my review. Sorry, guys. Um, I got it, you know, <laughs> my takes are always hot. Even in uh, piping hot, but they need to be edited. Even behind the keyboard, you know, I gotta yeah. get in there. I gotta yeah. write the com- that was I gotta a hot write the take comments. Of yes. An, yes. Of a... <laughs> Sorry, you know, I tell it like it is. You know, One me, Chris. Star that's for why that? that's why you have me on the show. Right. Takes like hey, that. I, I, that is. I'm not gonna lie, because you're like the phantom of people. You know, <laughs> at your worst, and probably what I expect <laughs> most of the time, total trash. <laughs> but <laughs> every once in a while, you just give us some just beautifully piping hot takes and, and that's what and i'm even, hoping even for. even you don't know how you do it <laughs> right even you I'm don't know still how you waiting do it. for a top 50 ba brewery to close by the end of the year that was one of my prediction takes even though it's uh, almost it seems like uh, the logistics <laughs> of that happening are quite impossible but hey don't fingers don't, crossed don't let doug get you down uh, with his like technical yeah, logistics right. and savvy Who his like on? i'm quote unquote looking into the future aka bart watson already told me this is <laughs> happening <laughs> So, how are you, uh, Mr. Take? Uh, I'm I'm good. I'm uh, you know dealing uh, dealing. Um, have a have a. This is a tiny little take. I tiny hear. little take. Ti- oh yeah, I have a yeah. take. I right? have a um, little take. A son little now, take. a six month old named Otto, uh, who uh, is Otto is great uh, and uh, brings a lot of joy. He's also uh, messing up my sleep quite a bit, so I'm adjusting to that and. Uh, yeah, it's been great. That's been the main thing in my life the last uh, few months since I was on the show. Um, Good. Yeah. I hear lack of sleep call, uh, helps uh, invoke uh, steaming. Even hot wor- even worse takes. Yes. Takes. Yes. The best yeah. takes. I want I want Jake's takes to like just fall out of his mouth into a pile and steam up, like a nice steaming <laughs> sounds, pile. Sounds so disgusting. Yeah. That's what I want to happen. <laughs> You have a nice new shirt on, uh, Mr. Shalau. Oh, I, I like it. Is that a citrus-style shirt you have? Oh, yeah, the pin. Oh. The, the, the hottest take gave me this amazing pin that people at home can definitely see. Yeah. It says... It's a Citra. Citra. And yeah. it has a registered R mark on <laughs> yeah, it. Registered trademark Citra. <laughs> and then it also, on the pin. It also says... It says Citra uh, R ball. HBC 394, just in case you need to know the HBC number of Citra. <laughs> that really helps the brand. Yeah. Where did it's you come a, come up? Where did that take? Where did that uh, take? Where did that the, pin come from? From the folks at YCH who, uh, yeah, they, they they have Citra. They sell Citra. Um, and I knew once I saw this pin, I needed to give it to the uh, leading advocate of Citra and Citra Futures, um, Mike Thank Chalau. You. Thank you so much. Yeah, man. Appreciate that. Method dust, baby. <laughs> a Citra style ale. <laughs> One of our better trademark. Uh, also, also had a, trademark. Had a trademark on that Citra. That doesn't technically, yeah. We we don't have a trademark, but it was on there. It was on there. Yeah, we put. You just put that on things. Yeah, right. It makes they it did. Legit. Yeah, they do on their Citra. I'm so pretty sure they actually have Citra. a registered your yeah. Citra. Our, our. our. You know, who's don't don't yeah. back away from it. We both made that monstrosity. <laughs> That's not a monstrosity. <laughs> oh yeah, no that that great thing. It's great. It was not a monstrosity. <laughs> Please. Yeah, it was actually pretty good. Come on, monstrosity. That, <laughs> that offends me. Sorry, Chris. Sorry. Um, well, thanks for coming on the show, man. Of course. Thanks for having me. Are you ready? I'm ready. Or are you out of practice? You feel like you can um, still jump back well, into you know, it? Um, 
the, the key to hot takes is being completely out of practice at all times. So uh, there I am good. So let's go. Love it. Love it. Love it. Well, we have someone else who's been out of practice. About out of practice. Or, I mean, he's no longer. Definitely. Yeah, he's no have, longer a doctor. No, I mean, he I or a know. lawyer. Has he? I mean, when's the last time you crushed anything? It's a great question. Pat? We have got I mean, we've got uh, Pat Fahey. Uh, he used to be a crusher on last. I I'm oh, sorry, Pat. Pat. Santa Fahey, now that he's uh, <laughs> moved. Nice. Uh, get that in there. And uh, used to be a master crusher own. I don't even know. Are you even a certified crusher own crush server now? I mean, what are you? Yeah, that's a good Have you mean, cried? Got, Maybe you still I, are a master crusher own. I don't know. What's up I with you? I got some Terrace Bulba in front of me. So if there's, oh, uh, you know, okay. it's pretty crushy as they go. <laughs> yeah. All right, so you're crushing. All right, good, good. Once a crusher own, always a crusher own. Let's be honest. I would think so, but I had to ask. You can be a recovering crusher own, but you, you're it's still true. a crusher own. It's true. It's true. It's less about the volume of the crush and more about the quality of the crush. So right, if you're, it's some quality uh, crushing with if you got some Terrace Bulba way mm-hmm. down there in, in uh, f- New Mexico. I feel that way. Yes. So is uh, just. Out of curiosity, I have to ask. I think I know the answer. Uh, is uh, Santa Fahey named after you, or are you named after Santa Fahey? You know, I'm going to leave that one up to you and the Ooh. listeners to sort out, but I think the answer is obvious. Does, does your family have a Christmas party every year? <laughs> uh, does anyone dress no. up as like any... <laughs> No, I think you should. You have to now. You gotta dress up as Santa. Do your children I'm, still believe in you? Yeah, that's a good question. I believe in you, Pat. I believe the in children you. might not believe in you. I believe the in children you. definitely do not. Yeah, I, does Otto believe in Santa Pat Fahey? He, yeah. That's the first uh, express belief he's uh, come out with. That uh, was quite uh, quite uh, remarkable and astounding. But Pat, I know uh, you have uh, you're, you're, you have far reaches of influence in this country, so. That is incredible. I had, I had no, I I didn't even know he was forming words yet. Yes, so so he's he's advanced. uh, Mama, Dada, and I believe in Santa (laughs) Pat Fahey. Exactly. Exactly. Pretty incredible. Then he said, "Crush." It's it's Pat. (laughs) It's Pat Santa Fahey, by the way, not Santa Fat Pat Fahey. (laughs) Change change the game. Fathead, whatever. Yeah. Anyway, okay. We've got. We're off to a great start. (laughs) We're off to a good start. Um, the fade really threw you off. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, for real. So, what are we here to talk about, Mike? Styles. Okay. And why? The, what? What are styles? What right. are styles? And I think, more, like, at some point specifically, kind of things that we deem bullshit styles. Okay. That's what, yeah. what you're saying. I'll have to think about some of like, those. We, yeah. I don't know. I've never thought We've about never, that. You and I have never you know, lightly danced around things we disagree with stylistically. Well, tangents. No. <laughs> Everyone Sir, else is looking at us dude. oddly about why we're still talking about it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Never it's happened to mostly me. Mostly Surge. But here's the deal. We got two of the hottest takes in the game mm-hmm. right here. And we've got a guy who literally has a video where he goes through every single beer style in the right. world right so what we're gonna do is we're gonna play that three hour long video yeah. and then pause it after each style and then have and then... chat gbt give us an- <laughs> yeah. like responses right thoughtful responses is Cezanne a bullshit style chat gbt yes and he's gonna say yes and that's the end of it oh speaking <laughs> and of that which... and that's how you know it doesn't know everything <laughs> No, it's just a, a language algorithm bot or whatever it tells you whenever you ask it tough questions. That's true. Like, is Cezanne a, a bullshit style? Yeah. <laughs> I can tell you. Kind of is, to be honest. <laughs> kind of is. <laughs> uh, anyway, so where should we start off with, like, the style generally, how styles arise? I think we should really honestly th- throw it to Pat. All right. Because I mean, <laughs> all right, we're, th- we're running an ISO play. Right, right. So we're all running far away on one corner of the court and allowing Pat to cook. ISO. Yeah, yeah. He's gonna cook. Um. So so Pat. So let's start from. Uh. Well, not the very beginning, 
because like you know at some point it was like yeah in the beginning there was yeah some like sumerian like drinking beer out of a six foot straw but we don't need to (laughs) deal with that it's badass yeah uh (laughs) it's kind of cool um but uh at some point well yeah let's talk about i guess maybe and and before I even say a single thing, ask Pat to say anything. This show is a hardcore, piping, steaming, molten hot take show. Mm-hmm. Right? So don't hold yes. us to anything. Right. Okay? So everything we say and state as fact is a molten hot take. Right. Okay. So that, I, let's I just... appreciate that disclaimer. I was going to say, I haven't had yeah. to... I haven't had to spiel on this in a, in a little bit, so uh, that's just be a disclaimer. Everything really might be made up. <laughs> right, exactly. It, it's better that way. If I'm being perfectly honest. Right. So <laughs> now we've got uh, so Styles. Um, essentially, do you do you know when, like modern Styles as we know it? Uh, really kind of why and when they came to be, and if not, uh, pick it up where you do know about it. So I've got some things to say on that, and like I said, they may or may not be true, but I'll, we'll, we'll give it a shot. So, you know, a lot of like what we talk about as styles today, especially when we're looking at historic styles, like you look at British styles or Belgian styles, German styles, are kind of us – like retrofitting our idea of style onto how beer would have been made historically. So definitely across centuries of beer being produced, you would have had, uh, you know, groups of brewers sort of making beers that were similar in some ways and, and marketing them and selling them under certain names. But I think like the, at least as I remember it, the modern concept of, sort of more codified beer styles stems from whenever it would have been, it might've been the 1970s or 1980s when Michael Jackson started writing about beer, because he was one of the first people that really took to writing about, you know, a lot of different kinds of beers and trying, you know, some of his early books really go through and group different commercial examples into individual styles. And so while we have organizations like Brewers Association and BJCP today that exist as the sort of the arbiters of different style guidelines, um, even some of what exists in those style guidelines goes back to early writings of Michael Jackson. Yeah. And I, uh, this is a, uh, a, a, a take that I am now, it's a second generation date, but I remember talking to Stevie Hamburg, uh, and as I remember it, uh, he was talking about the earliest formation of the BJCP, which is the Beer Judge Certification Program guidelines, which I think were the first. I mean, I think the BJ, BA kind of came from the BJCP. Again, that's another hot take, but we're just going to keep dishing them out. Feels right. <clears throat> yeah, feels right. Directionally correct. And they were talking about um, uh, Porter and how um, there needed to be some sort of demarcation. They were talking about what a Porter was and what the guidelines needed to be. And someone's like, well, what about those other Porters that are kind of like, you know, bigger and chocolatier and this and that? And they're like, well, let's just make a robust Porter. And then it's just like how it came to be is somebody like deciding on the on the moment and somebody else agreeing that like, yeah, we should split Porter into. I don't know what the two were like, you know, brown, brown, brown and, and brown and robust. Yeah. So it's it, it's kind of an interesting note. And if you read like the preamble to the BJCP guidelines, it acknowledges some of those things. 
from my perspective and my perspective on styles has changed over the years. It's First a lot of all, we've all read the preamble. You don't have to, yeah, like, if you have. Kind of, duh. All of us here, obviously, you're not the only one who's read that in the world. No, this is just, <laughs> this is for the dear listeners that don't want to go to the trouble of, of They've all listened to through. it, too. Everyone, you're not the only person who's ever read it. Trust me. I'm not, I'm not saying. Anyways. <laughs> anyways. So one of the things uh, that they note, and one of the things that I think is important to remember when it comes to like style guidelines, whether they are from BJCP or the Brewers Association, is the style guidelines are developed for competition judging. And like they are really important in that context. Uh, I've done a fair amount of judging over the years, and I've judged a couple competitions where it was just like, how much do you like this one? And it's, it was like a garbage disaster of a mess trying to judge a competition like that having style guidelines where it's like is this a good example of this style as defined by these guidelines makes judging a much easier exercise and so what i was going to say about the preamble is that they note that the guidelines were developed explicitly for judging specifically for bjcp judging homebrew competitions and that when they wrote them they had no idea that like people were going to pick these up and use them to learn about beer or that breweries were going to use this to inform the type of beers that they've made. But that is definitely a thing that we've seen over the years is that when BJCP introduces a style or says like, yeah, this is a legit style that does impact how commercial breweries make beer, which is definitely something that they never intended or foresaw happening. So it's, it is an interesting cut consequence and it's one of the reasons why i think uh, just the existence of the guidelines the existence of styles is important i've right. seen pat at these competitions <clears throat> it's pretty awesome but they read the preamble and he stands and puts, <laughs> puts his hand, hand over his heart, heart. Yeah. yeah he does and mouths it along yeah he does I've seen yeah, him yeah, doing he mouths that. it i've seen him i've seen him start to tear up i've seen him at baseball games when they're singing the national anthem do the same thing and i watch his lips and i'm like mm, that's the preamble to the preamble BJCP, BJCP style style guideline, style guideline cuz i know it <laughs> yeah. cuz i know, I know it, it by and heart. that's and that's I, what you I, I even knew it was a thing right yeah cuz you had your binoculars on him from yeah. like seven sections away that's right Staring well, I, well, at that's him. normal for me, though. <laughs> exactly. Mouth. Full, disclo- full disclosure, <laughs> I like realized we were doing this conversation today, so last night I was like, I should probably look over the guidelines and be able to say something about yeah. that. So. <laughs> oh, good. Well, well, well done. Yeah, well, there's also the kind of the commercial brewer version of style, which is just a way to present expectations for your beer, right? And I, totally. th- I think that is how style really began i think and that's what well at modern style as we kind of know it and what michael jackson who i think as far back as we can i think realistically go because i'm sure if you go back further it was like you know the lager from pilsen the pilsener you know like that that i mean there was always like stuff just like straight up identifications of beer is probably the beginning of style the light beer the dark beer the hell the the dunkel you know stuff like that the wit um but then you have um michael jackson kind of to the american and english audience uh portraying that information like this is what they call these beers they call this the light this the dark this the white this the lambic this the whatever and then there was other stuff that like just didn't have n- names to it beers that we would think of as like old classic styles which maybe had been brewed for a long time but might not have had like groupings of style names right like I think, like Flemish Red, Br- uh, Oud Brun, uh, 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 Belgian Strong Pale, uh, like all those those beers, um, were were literally just given they names. Were just beers. They were just beers, right? What's I up? mean, that's that's one that I even like. I almost brought up in talking about Michael Jackson. So in Belgium, like one Belgians don't subscribe to the ideas of the idea of style very much period but specifically like flanders red and oud brune there is no real distinction 
it, for most Belgians between those two styles. That was like a distinction that Michael Jackson created in kind of grouping Leafman's products into one style category and Rodenbach's products into another. And it's a, like a distinction that continues to exist over here to this day to the, the point where like, you know, it's not as popular now as it was in maybe like the 2010s, but you have American breweries making Flemish reds and Oud Bruins. And, you know, you talk to a Belgian about it and they're like, no, those are like, those are the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Um, they're just the sour beer from that area. Right. Mm -hmm. And this is how one person makes it. And this is how another makes it. But it is also funny because if you talk to someone like, oh, I'm going to have to sneeze again. Hold on. Bless you. <laughs> Well, I was saying that there are not to oh, go ahead. I thought it was going to be longer. <laughs> it might be. I think I'm done. Okay. So it is funny when like listening to someone like Ron Pattinson, the uh the English beer historian, friend of the uh, show. Friend of the show, obviously. Um not obviously, but I'm very happy to have him be a friend of the show. Um so when he talks, everything is so segmented. I mean, just like even by today's standards, it's highly segmented. Like right. this was a uh, – people are like, oh, an old Yorkshire versus a Tadcaster versus an Old Ale versus uh, a Barley Wine versus a Winter Warmer. Those are all kind of the same things. And he's like, no, they're all <laughs> very distinct right. differences because of the 0.1% gravity difference and uh, how, how much of that is how the people making it or drinking it then really felt about those beers and how much of it is just the way that he personally I draws differences like, i don't know i mean is, he seems to draw differences right and i'm not but gonna I think it argue has a with lot him. to do with like the fact that when you spend your life obsessing over something so specific as british beer you tend to make more delible lines or indelible more specific lines between <laughs> between right. things that uh that you know might not have actually had as hard lines in between them, right? And, and I, I think when people when people are more academic about beer rather than making and consuming it, that's when lines get very specific because you need to be able to write about something specifically and categorize something specifically. Well, I think with Ron, what he is trying to look at is what the consumer or the brewer at the time was trying to convey. And when there are differences, he will, because he'll say pale ale and bitter are the same. I mean, sure. he's, I mean, that's where I got that from. Yeah. Uh, but if there was a difference at the time, he'll say, well, you know, this was from, the, but it also could have been a hundred years apart. Right. You know? <laughs> so yeah. it's like, but it is interesting. I'm just curious uh, again, hot take uh sorry is that trademarked yeah my lawyers will be contacting you chris okay. well whatever i've got a license cost us deal. money every time we say that yeah. even though you came up with it that's true i know no back. i didn't actually <laughs> i was he was uh, uh John, jonathan no jonathan was the one that's like oh hot take jake I was like, <laughs> i'll be i'll be putting that one in my back pocket <laughs> um spicy boy yeah exactly um so yeah, I I think with the uh, when I heard about the I'm trying to like re re catch catch myself back up uh, mentally. So with the uh, you know with Ron Pattinson and him kind of diving that, uh, I just think with Michael Jackson, maybe it's just like how they are used to needing to have kind of nomenclature to these things and not being okay with it just being like, eh, it's just Orval. That's just Rodenbach. That's just Hoogarden. Right. You know, that's just this, this. Or colloquially, it's called this. But I think it's almost become like... Uh, Shocking the English wanted to categorize, segment, and control things. Weird. <laughs> right. But now in, in the U.S., it's... So, I, I mean, I'm guessing all you people here have been at a bar where they don't list beer styles and us being, you know, the the completely sane people we are, are probably unsettled by it. I am. It was just the name of a beer, which is probably like, you know, white paint on wall, orange fox. 
by <laughs> Dartboard Brewing. So now there's like no reference to like anything and sure. it has no style on it. And you're like, well, I'm not going to go anywhere near that beer because I feel uncomfortable right now. I need someone to hold my hand and sure. tell me what the style is. So I think we've been somewhat conditioned to need that. Would you? Th- do you think that might be a, uh, as a result of some of this BJCP stuff? You have to thank Mike, uh, Michael Jackson, Pat, for that, and Stevie Hamburg to a lesser extent. <laughs> do I think Stevie on. Hamburg? Do you I blame think Stevie, Stevie Hamburg, Hamburg for all sorts of things? <laughs> but I don't know. Um, you know, to the point. I think Mike. I think you were talking about this. Uh, so uh, when I when I think about styles, two very important functions: the sort of the strict sense for competition judging, and then I think the more functional sense for communicating to customers what they're going to consume. I don't necessarily think that that is explicitly a product of, you know, Michael Jackson writing about beer cells. I don't know. I think it's, uh, if anything, I would say that, and I I can't necessarily speak to all this because I was not like a beer consumer of, I I didn't drink a lot of craft beer in the mid nineties, but I think as like American craft beer developed and part of that development was sort of this exploration of traditional styles from other places. And in some cases creating American variations of those styles, I think as American craft brewers began to sort of expand the palette of what was available to drinkers, it would have been essential that they communicate styles to their customers just as a shorthand way of being able to talk about this, at least in the U S newly widely available, different set of, of flavors. So I I don't know if anything, I think it's more just a product of that, early time in American craft beer that has continued on to today where we were seeing all of these different styles being made by breweries. Right. Like until like the, I mean, arguably seventies, maybe the eighties, if you saw beers on a menu in America, it was the same thing. It was going to be, it was going to be a, a, a macro lager of some sort or an import, right? Which is also probably a macro lager of some sort. So, And even early on, I mean, I remember uh, one of the first styles that I can remember seeing as a kid growing up in southeastern Pennsylvania and being curious, like, what does that mean? Was uh, looking at my dad's pony bottles <clears throat> of Rolling Rock which is why those bottle, bottles were called ponies, by the way, because the big ones had the horse and the little ones had the pony Kid on beers. it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for children. Yeah, it was beer for children, beer, exactly. Beer facts. Yeah. TM. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it was called an uh, extra pale ale. Is what it was. Wait, can that be right now that I'm saying that? I think that was the cans of tuna. You're thinking of Half, half Acres tuna. Uh, is that what I'm thinking about as a, as a child? <laughs> yeah. Or a torpedo, maybe. Maybe just Rolling Rock Extra Pale. I don't know if they said Extra Pale Ale, because it almost certainly is not a an ale. <laughs> but anyway, as a small child, you were very drawn we're, to this we're, Extra we're Pale this. style we're of Rolling look Rock. This. Uh, I've got a picture of it right here. I mean, it, this is going to be great. This is a, some great audio content for you <laughs> It says, yeah, extra pale. You're right. It just says extra pale. Um, and being like, well, what? What is that? You know, what? what is extra pale? What does that even mean? Um, and so I Wait, do so think... So even as a child, you were wondering this as compared to regular Rolling Rock? Yeah. No, no, no. Not I as regular Rolling I... Rock. No, no. I All think... Rolling Rock was called extra extra pale. Sure. And I, I thought of I... that as like, oh, that's a that means that's good. That's good. The fact that it's extra pale is good. I don't think I thought about beer styles until I was like 23. <laughs> that's crazy that as a kid you'd clock that. Well, like this is what it said. Yeah. What is extra pale? Like my dad drinks this stuff. Yeah. What does extra pale mean? Sure. Like, what what is that? Uh-huh. Okay. So what's not so so extra pale means probably pale is good. I mean, just like the things that I would think about, like what is this stuff that he's drinking, you know? And uh, so so I think that gets to the 
other side of it, which is there's always been, at least in the American beer scene, in our lifetimes, a marketing aspect to it as well. Not just an educational, identifiable aspect to it, which is what we've been talking about up till now. But I do think the two things are linked together very much. Mm -hmm. Um, Extra pale is not a style, right? But descriptor. It's a descriptor. But I do think that you start to kind of those two things are are so closely related, you know, because what is a style but a descriptor, right? I mean, isn't that really what you're trying to do with a style? You're trying to describe the beer. Mm -hmm. Well, and a a way you could kind of look at that in in present-day context, I would say, is like the IPAification of everything, where it's like IPA is a style. It means something, or it did. Um, and it still does to an extent, but it you know, means that's, buy it now, right? Yeah, is that it, what means it still buy means buy it. That's <laughs> that is what it means. Now. Well, that's the thing is, so IPA became the sort of juggernaut of a like a sales producing style, and so brewers and breweries and marketing people at breweries were like, how can we apply this name to more and more things? Maybe it's a session IPA. Maybe. Previously, we had a beer that was like a dry hop stout. Well, let's call it a black IPA now. Like, you know, we is is took... IPA now? Is that is that the light of the eighties? You know, where everything was like light lager, light beer, light this, extra pale, all that sort of stuff. Uh, or just like it, say it's light. Say I think it's it, light. It more just signifies craft. Like, that's where we're at now is that for most consumers, IPA means craft beer. Like, people are mostly buying their beer at grocery stores. That's my I thought. would like to I would like to think that it still has some meaning, and I think the meaning that it still retains is that it is in some way, shape, or form going to be kind of hoppy. Hoppy is what but, I think of it, yeah. Yeah. It yeah. used to mean that it was, like, strong and pale and bitter and hoppy, but it doesn't necessarily mean any of those things other than hoppy at this point. Oh, and that it was an ale, but it doesn't mean that anymore either. So I think it might mean both. I think it might mean both that not, – not that it's not an ale, but it's hoppy and that it's craft because I do still think – I think more so that it's hoppy, but also a little bit that it's craft because you don't have Nick Ultra, Bud – Miller coming out with their own IPAs. They they leave that for their more crafty brands. And that's for a, a very, it's not an accident. I mean, that's extremely deliberate that they do that because I think it is still associated with a, a craft. Right, I think it's the modern shorthand for craft, probably higher ABV, in a way for like companies – and now this is more specifically thinking about like larger companies, but like this is worth the extra dollar you got to pay IPA. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, now it's not how most craft breweries use it within ours. Our uh, sphere, I don't know. But... DDH is definitely saying right. worth the extra three dollars you have to pay. Right, but that's not IPA. That's <laughs> worth the extra. That's worth the extra three dollars you have to pay because right. it's double dry hopped. Yeah. Well, it should be it should cost double then, shouldn't it? Right. Exactly, because all the cost is in the dry hopping. A lot of it. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of so it. So if you double it, then you should double the cost. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you. But I think like that's like a, a more ma- IPA. Your beer more. should be free then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Undry hop. That's what we're yeah. going to start putting on it. There you go. Be giving it away. I mean, it basically is. For, um, but yeah, I think that it's more a signaling mechanism of, of hoppy craft beer. Um, and then DDH is our own nerd version of that, where it's like even hoppier, even more worth it. But all of these are just like little messages you like you send to the con- the person who's buying it, tell them hopefully have them some have some idea of what they're gonna get, and then you either sub like give them that like deliver on that expectation, or you subvert it in some way. Uh, that's my understanding of style, at least. Sure, sure. Um... <sighs> So, and then I think we've gotten to like a, a post or even a post post modern place with style. Yeah, so that's what I want to ask Jake. Where like Mr. Postmodern. Right. I mean, that's how I Mr. think. Mr. Worldwide, Mr. Postmodern. Yeah. One and the same. Yeah. Used to be Mr. Three O Five. Now you're Mr. Postmodern. <laughs> I'll take Jake. There we go. Woo-wee. 
teeth. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so where we are with style, are we? Too, is it too soon to get into where we are with style right now? I mean, I don't think so. We're like forty-eight. <laughs> We're like two hours into this. No, I'm <laughs> right. might be too late. Half hour. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whoever's still listening, I think it's time we get into like where style is now. Right. So, I think style. Well, let's say. I mean, you're with a a working brewing entity that creates a bunch of style. What does style mean to you? And what importance does it play to to Hopewell? Like in a in a very kind of like literal way. Like what what does style mean to you guys? If anything, maybe it doesn't mean anything to you guys. You don't care. Well, we're definitely not traditionalists, although we do a fair amount of traditional styles. Um, and when but, you say traditionalist, what do you mean by that? Um, well, we're not dogmatic about um, you know. If we brew a Pilsner, um, we're not going to use the Pilsen water. We're not going to bring in necessarily German malts because that's what Pilsner's made there. We want to put a little bit of our own um, take on it. No, that's like a, a, a pretty cliche line at this point, but I do think that's Im- important to give some um, sense of, of uh, lens You're over. Not BJ styles. Steve Hamburg. No, no. We, we, yeah, it, like, yeah. you know. Double birds to Stevie Hand. I think ultimately style for us is something to um, play with um, a little bit, but ultimately it is a way to frame for our customers what to expect out of our beers. We um, we try to be very transparent uh, about what it is you're about to drink. We're, um, we try very hard not to be cynical um, and not to say that we don't go after trends or, or play into trends, but um, I think style for us is, yeah, it's, it's something to – as a um, as a grounding point for a drinker, um, ultimately, yeah, it's 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 in the most neutral sense of the term, it is marketing, right? Um, but it's it, it can be important marketing. It also can be um, messed with quite a bit to um, confuse people, which is, I think, where I uh, personally have issues with with style um, a, as a kind of a pervasive um, dictator of like what gets sold. I want to get to that in in just a little bit, but I I also want to ask um, the three of you, really, because you guys are all on the supply side now. I mean, it. I agree that it's definitely with it. Marketing is is definitely at its purest form, like kind of what it is in that. And I don't mean that in a negative way. Sometimes I think people say marketing and they think it mean in, in a bad way. I mean it as like labeling how do you put this thing to market and let people know what they're going to expect it's just a can of beer called fluffy bunny whatever you know beer i mean the names of beers are awesome i love them and um uh, like headhunter you know like that one i'm drinking right now um but i i do think that uh you, you know you need to be able to to put out what is there if it's just marketing, though, I think it's also style is so like ingrained in all of our heads that you probably think in like you know how like if you're learning a new language, they say like once you're dreaming in that language, you know you know that you're starting to actually learn it. Like we probably, well, we you guys, when you're coming up with beers, are you thinking somewhat in in terms of style almost as a language even if you're iterating off of it like kind of like this but but not like that because how else can you then communicate to one another even within your own company uh, what you want to do if it isn't based on on style i mean other unless you're talking like raw ingredients or or flavor and technicality i would think that style has to play like an integral part to how us in America talk about beer, even from the creation process. Uh, at Pipeworks, we thought about it very, very little during the creation process. Um, <clears throat> because everything's the, obviously an IPA, and then what do we do to it? I mean, that's uh, that, no, not everything. And it was an IPA there. There's a lot of different stuff that went on there. Um, certain things were based on IPAs, but 
most of the stuff there was like, we have this idea to make it taste like this. And then we would work backwards, like, well, how, what style is this thing actually after you wrote the recipe? And like, if it's this, you know, um, if it's, we would call it stuff, we made a beer that tasted like cinnamon toast crunch cereal milk, right? And we called it a cream ale, even though it had nothing to do with a traditional cream ale. It had corn in it because we thought it was funny to call it a cream ale, but it was 10% alcohol and had lactose in it and stuff. But the idea was more to like make something that tasted like something specific, to find what it's going to taste like, and then work our way back to what the style actually would be for most of that. Seems pretty it, groundbreaking in a way. It's funny for, for you to, uh, to, to talk about those Pipeworks beers yeah. like that, but in a way... Maybe uh, maybe it's just time and nostalgia, but I mean, uh, 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 that's what they were. I mean, we would have a meeting every week, and it'd be an idea of like, I want to make a beer, to try to make a beer that tastes like this. I, I think over time, those got less and less. Like, I want to make this crazy thing, and more like, can we just make a good porter? But um, during the most creative period of Pipeworks, it was certainly style was something we applied last. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's atypical. That's, cool. that's very atypical. Yeah, that's cool. Um, Maybe uh, not. I don't know. Is it? I mean, let's Jake and and Pat. I mean, well, it, it is is was is different too because I only make things within one style of beer, right? Well, there you go. Within and one I'm style. not really talking, but I'm not also not like having conversations with anyone. I just like <laughs> write a recipe for myself, and so it's more that I have these tools there. Where I have this these this yeast and this kind of vernacular that is saison, but I don't try to make something that tastes just. Most of the time, I don't try to make something that tastes just like a Blaugy beer. I try to make something that I'm like, oh, it'd be cool if I use this thing, or how do I incorporate this technique? And then it, it is a saison, so I don't have to worry about what style it's going to be because I use that yeast. But uh, two very different approaches. Mm. So sorry, I don't know what, where we no, went from there. But that was perfect. That was okay. great. That was great. What about um, what? you, uh, Jake, or you? Um, we, I'll yeah, let Jake go first. <laughs> we we very rarely work backwards from a flavor profile. Um, yeah, it's just not been our approach. Um, I think that's a cool way to do it, though. I don't. There's, I have no issues I, with that at all. I, I think, think it's, that's a, it's a very old approach at yeah. this point too. Like very it's very home it's very, 20, very 2016. Right. Like it's different. I don't think very it is old, a very old. You know. I, I wouldn't say it is a very homebrew approach though, because homebrewers are so steeped in BJCP and style guidelines like it's some sometimes mm-hmm. yes it's like hey i want to create this crazy out there thing but i feel like a lot of homebrew is about hewing as closely as possible to style guidelines yeah i i, I would agree with that i think um i remember when i was last homebrewing which is probably at this point like call it nine years ago it was um we we were mostly responding to what was out in the market so it wasn't like homebrewing was necessarily fueling um, I, there's a little bit of back and forth there, but yeah, we weren't, uh, the homebrewers at the time that I was around, we weren't, uh, going super crazy off the rails. Maybe, you know, I think the most you would see is like co- coffee, coconut or things like that. But, um, not, not like the stuff that Piper was doing, which was, yeah, I would agree. It was pretty groundbreaking, uh, for, for craft beer at the time. And, um, definitely cool. I think it's, um, influenced a, a certain section of, of brewing today. Um, e- even for, if, for even better, if just like worse. locally or regionally, I mean, yeah, I think there's another thing too is like when we're talking about style, this is all in the context of a huge craft beer boom as well and everything being everyone's kind of in conversation with each other. And so, you know, prior, you know, say prior to this boom, you know, hundreds of years ago, you had one brewery in a town or a couple, you know, a few breweries in a town, but they're all making the same thing and they're not they're not uh, referencing other regionals or other countries. They're just kind of brewing what's local. So that's why, you know, the styles like Pilsner and things like that came about if I'm if I'm to be correct here. But, uh, you know, I think it's very different than now when um, concurrent with like Michael Jackson's book, you know, you had breweries like Sierra Nevada open and like everything that it was kind of the earth text, right? Where we're exploring beer through that book. And um, I think that's kind of why American craft beer is so different than the rest of the world, or at least the, the kind of um, the more preeminent uh, cultures of, of brewing. Well, when when you right. guys at Hopewell, sorry, uh, sorry, Matt, what do you want to say? No, no uh, worries. Uh, when you guys at Hopewell come up with something that you think is significantly different than something that currently exists, how do you go about communicating that to consumers? Like, uh, I, I don't want to lead you too much, but like with Lupo Lager and things like that, like you're clearly trying to 
you've created something that's different than what you think exists already in the current vernacular for style. Yeah. So I you want to apply something else to it. So how I, do you go about that and how do you think about that? And how does I think like Lupa Lager for us specifically is very low stakes where, um, you know, it's different than saying, oh, we're making hazy IPAs, but we refuse to call them hazy IPAs or whatever. Lupa Lager in, is in the in conversation with overall broader like hoppy lager category. Um, and just like looking at that, we found that there was just a lot of baggage and, and, and preconceived notions of like what IPL would taste like or hoppy lager or dry hop lager and just like different way, like across the board, really different interpretations of how that beer should taste in the, in the final product. Like, you know, some breweries you talk to, they do hoppy lagers. They're trying to have it taste more traditional Pilsner or Hellas, but with a little bit of like a noble hop kind of aromatic to it for us. It's a, it's a very different final product. Like internally, we kind of think of them as like imagine a, a West Coast IPA, but with kind of the refine, refined structure and in, in, um, finish of a cold fermented and conditioned lager. Um, so we kind of went off and, and decided, let's call this our thing Lupo Lager. We then don't have to be beholden to... Um, the, the preconceived notions, obviously there's a bit, of, there's a lot of education at work there, but we found that there was still a lot of education. If, if we were going to call something a hoppy lager an IPL or a double dry hop lager, or we, we never did it, but a, a cold IPA. Um, and all these things are to say that like lupa lager, you know, we could call it any of those things. That doesn't make it the liquid any different, but it makes it how we communicate it, um, a lot more on our terms, which was why, why we did that. But, um, again, I said it, it's low stakes because that, that whole hoppy lager category is so kind of open-ended and there aren't really any of these like BJCP style guidelines that dictate other, uh, other kind of beers in the world. Not to get too pedantic, but for, for you and so this, so I understand you're thinking hopefully the, the customer will, you think those, those are significantly different than like a cold IPA or a West coast Pilsner which are all, I think, dancing around that same idea. I don't think that they're about. necessarily different. That's not the point. I'm not, we're not trying to draw a line in the sand that these are specifically different. We think this is a better way to communicate um, for us what to expect because, like I said, there's, there's a lot of variation across the board on these, on these beers, IPLs, et cetera, um, and we didn't want to be tied to whatever that was. We've, don't, we've never had a cold IPA. I mean, like, sorry, the like, Wayfinder stuff, like the, the kind of the, the, yeah. the originators of the style. We've had, you know other ones around and they all kind of taste very different. So again, we kind of want to own this thing and hopefully over time our customers say, Oh, I really like these Lupo loggers that Hopewell's doing. And maybe that takes off from here, but at the end of the day, again, it's low stakes. And if it's just our loyal fan base, you know, drinking through the small batches that we're doing of the stuff, that's, that's fine. Well, I think there's also always a balance between like defining something for yourself and being able to communicate it to consumers that are, that are paying attention to your brand and the beers you're making or uh, grabbing the extra equity that exists in styles that are hot or pre-existing and stuff. You always have to make that choice when you're doing something that like has overlap or uh, you know is somewhat similar. And you could be like, well, if we just call it a cold IPA, then we'll get this group of people. But you want to make something. Right. Well, it's not really. We don't feel like it's really that. So yeah, and I think the thing with cold IPA, which is like a little bit of a philosophical thing for us too, is that. It felt like if we were going to the trouble of lagering this thing, um, we wanted to let people know that it is a lager. Why, re why relinquish uh, a cool aspect of this beer to the ever-growing field of IPA? It felt to us just kind of like shortchanging the beer. And yeah, like to be honest with you, I, we know we're, we're probably leaving sales on the table in the short term, not calling it a cold IPA. But again, low stakes. We have, we have hazy IPAs. We have pale ales that... That drive the business so this is kind of a little bit of a pet project for us reminds me of uh how pure project calls their hazies murky ipa is like <laughs> I mean, maybe I didn't even know they did that oh yeah they do but maybe it's like gives them some freedom to be like well this doesn't taste well this is a murky IPA. but at the same time i think with lupo yeah i mean maybe you are leaving like you said some some sales on the table but it does give you some freedom to be like well this is what kind of we do and it, it is a good example of um taking style into your own hands and just being like this is a style we because we say it's a style right um pat you were well, about to say something yeah 
I don't even know what I was going to say, and I don't know if it matters. But I was going to say to to that end, I feel like uh, Lupa Lager also is like like it's a cool name, it's a cool idea for a brand, and I feel like with Hopewell as like a more like you guys are more focused on a smaller local market, like you're able to build that brand beyond people just looking for a, a cold IPA people like going like, no, specifically I want hope like one of Hopewell's Lupa lagers. Yeah. So I feel like to your point of like, maybe it leaves some on the table, but maybe ultimately it builds a stronger thing that has better traction with your fan base. I don't know. I think it's a cool choice personally. Thanks. Yeah. That's kind of, that's where our head's at with it. Like you said, we're small so we can, we can play in these margins. Um, where bigger brands um, can't, they have to kind of, if they're going to go the route of these, the hoppy lager, they have to call it cold IPA. IPA. That's just like kind of where the the state of, of that particular, that, that style is right now. Um, it's also crazy how those newer styles kind of catch like that. I, that name is so stupid, right? Like, right. Like objectively, it's like the Beatles, like out of context, like that's the dumbest name. It's like a dumb pun. <laughs> But cold IPA is also just like, what? Like, why would that catch on with people? But then all of a sudden these things have traction and they have uh, value to the consumer that the breweries might not even really want to tap into. Uh, and honestly, it has the IPA bump. Like, the, like the, what I'm sure something we'll talk about in the second half is the, in the more, the BSE styles is just IPA everything. You mean the BA styles? Oh, no, you mean the BS. Bullshitty. Yeah. Um, are we allowed to say that, Serge? I... No, we're not allowed to say that. He's just going to give me a nod, so I'm just going to keep saying it. <laughs> as, he so, wrote, as he wrote down that he's going to have to go home. So and now that this. we've walked down the once and forever history of <laughs> style, I think now we should talk about where style, and we're, we're very much talking about it right now, where style kind of plays into the current marketplace, but... I want to get to, we're going to take a break, okay. but what I want to get to is the stuff that we love about style, and I'm talking about you and me, Mike, and hopefully Pat, and hopefully, maybe hopefully not Pat. I want I want maybe some pushback as well. I hope Pat hates styles. I hope Pat, Pat, I... Pat loves styles <laughs> and, and loves every new style that comes out. And Doesn't that sound like me? It does sound like you. Yeah. That's so we can keep on top top of it and update the preamble incessantly. As I know he exactly. does. I, it's a wiki now. I, he always know, sends it doing... to me. He's like, "Have you seen my new entry on the preamble to the BJCP style guideline?" <laughs> yes, Pat. You know, I and looked I'm up rolling last my night. eyes well, at Matt Margaret. It. Meanwhile, I'm like, "Yeah, I've I've read the new preamble, Pat." I was like, "Oh man, like we're doing the style talk. I should probably look at the guidelines." And I was like, "Oh man, they had new guidelines come out in 2021. I didn't even realize." <laughs> and you got super excited. <laughs> I did not. But. Yeah, I'm going to judge the shit out of these. Sorry. Just... Yeah, exactly. So why don't we get, uh, take a quick break, mm -hmm. uh, come back and talk about the our favorite things about the current state of beer styles. All right. So we'll be back in just a moment with that. Welcome back to the Beer Temple Podcast. We're talking styles with our main style guys, Pat. Santa Fehi, aka the Crusherone, Master Crusherone, still proud to know that he's still Crusheroning it out in uh, the mountain time zone. Um, oh, he's got an Allagash White, right? Oh, now. oh, geez. It's getting when weird. I heard somebody say that Allagash, like that you guys were the Allagash White of pods and that was a three star, I was deeply offended. <laughs> three and, you would have gotten a three and a half, right? Uh, like a six, six out of five. Oh, <laughs> wow. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> Personal uh, opinion. Right, right. No, I get it. I get it. Um, I don't know if you do. I, oh, I get it. I mean, <laughs> maybe I don't. Not, not, <laughs> not, not at your level. And then we've also got the, uh, the hot take, Jake. Uh, indeed, indeed. Indeed. Um, and we're talking styles. And um, so we talked about we've we've pretty much buttoned up the history of styles, mm -hmm. right? So Un un definitively, so don't need to talk, don't need to ever. Nobody listening rock. needs to read another word unless it's the new another preamble word. for the JBCP style guy. Obviously, obvi. <laughs> PJCP. What did I say? 
You got it right, I'm Nailed sure. It, Whatever yeah. you said, it was right. Killed it, as usual. Mm-hmm. You know, be a hot take for a moment. <laughs> you got it right. Um, we talked even a, a little bit about what it kind of plays in today's marketplace, but that's what I kind of want to go into now is how is style being used now at a at a wider level and i think it is going to be a mixed bag because even as can i talk about like earlier today what what i kind of had mentioned mike Mm -hmm. so we were at the green lady friend of the show for (laughs) fits friend of the show (laughs) talking to people who are friends of the show and uh someone was uh asking what you do and uh i think uh mike thorpe friend of the show mm-hmm. of afterthought was also there and uh he was like oh that's the like most low key answer i've ever heard but your <laughs> your answer was i brew saison yeah and uh well it was in context he's like who do you brew for and it was his i said is was and then we, i brew saison i brew saison that's not like how i define myself as a human being <laughs> yeah. oh, big chunk of it on oh, yeah. uh, sad but i was like okay so one of those three words was uh style mm-hmm. you know like i brew saison and uh, so it still plays a huge role in just identifying kind of like the beers that we drink. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think because of that, it has been, you know, commercialized. I, I, I really do. Uh, and I think that it gets played for dollars. I don't know how else to put it. I mean, I think it's like, well. It's manipulated. In, manipulated, uh, in yeah. Coerced and somewhat misleadingly i feel sometimes that, that muddy talk waters. to me about the the misleading well i mean the the ipaification of all things is kind of the the hallmark of it in american craft beer where like a milkshake ipa has absolutely nothing to do with an ipa with like uh with ruination ipa right where like i think or some or or headhunter like they have Nothing in common phenotypically, right? With the way they they present to you when you drink them, like probably as similar as like Who Garden and Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, right? So while that, that puts it in a style family, it's a style. It's an IPA, but it's has the beer that gets produced in that style has nothing to do with what traditionally an IPA would be, and it clearly is an. I called an IPA because it will sell better if it's called an IPA, mm-hmm. right? Like it's, and maybe the early ones were like offshoots and had a lot more to do with like hoppiness or bitterness. And it was just like throwing lactose in there and fruit to like have fun. But the way that that style evolved and, and certainly there's other examples, but like it's. Or slushy IPAs as yeah. they are now. And I'm not saying that things shouldn't evolve and change or be, you know, named in trees or families of things, but like that's a, a, a glaring example of like it's called an IPA because they sell better if they're called IPAs. Well, can I push, milkshake push, ale wouldn't sell as I well as push, milkshake. IPA. <laughs> true. Can I push back and say, well, maybe there was a thread in the beginning and it's just kind of like a vestigial tail. Uh, yeah. Sure. That also happens to be really good for sales. <laughs> Right. I don't know. It could be. Yeah, it's possible. And I, I think those first ones probably were, you know, it was it based on brewing where we're throwing a lot of hops in. But as bitterness goes down and as hoppiness goes up and as sweetness goes up and as adding fruit to it, like it's like one of these like Plato's beard situations where if I have one hair on my face, do I have a beard? If I have two hairs on my face, do I have a beard? If I like at what point does it go, go from being... Uh, a bald face to a beard does it go from being an IPA to something so dissimilar that it shouldn't Let me ask be called that, call that anymore. Do I have a full head of hair? Uh, no. Okay. Well, there you go. Obviously, there is a point at which it becomes obvious. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But, the, yeah. but it's, it's less so with IPA is the argument he's trying to make. Oh, man. Okay. You know, I... So I, I can't just as, call myself a... A, uh, a a a shiny, full-headed, full-haired guy. You can or... call yourself whatever you want. Ooh. Like they, can I call, can market myself can however I want. Yeah, exactly. You just have to convince enough people that it is that. I'm just check dark, full-haired. It's <laughs> the most popular style of hairdo right now. Yeah. Well, and there's also like, 
there's some styles that like specifically Saison that's interpreted so broadly like originally the the real Saisons there's only one like right that's another style where you're like well there's only one that it's kind of bullshit like there's only one exam a commercial example of a Saison that started the Saison really you're talking about the farmhouse El DuPont DuPont all of those beers are basically more or less DuPont they're small producers there's different takes on it but I would push back on that and I can't claim that with a hundred percent certainty, but I am, I am pretty sure that when you look at like other Belgian French producers that they like, you look at like Thierry and Blaugy and Fantome and uh, you know, all of these different producers that they weren't just trying to riff off of what DuPont was doing. And I could be wrong about that, uh, but I don't think that that's the case. Maybe not dire- like directly being like, we're trying to make our own clone version of DuPont, but they certainly created the parameters for that style of having a phenolic ester, dry, uh, hot fermented. Like all those things are mostly come from DuPont more than we, more than we want to believe, right? That as a commercialized product, that's a thing that was started at DuPont. Like I know several of those breweries you named. We have to get roll. They have to get roll back on. They use the they use, they started off using the DuPont yeast. It just kind of does yeah. different Curie stuff now. So. But. Well, you don't know that. No, I do know that. He told me. He told me how he started. Sure. He, and you believe him. Well, it wasn't a very romantic origin story. Right. He said he picked a yeast from a... Yeast bank. From a Belgian yeast bank. Yes. Mm. The one that he liked. They went through a bunch. He picked one that he liked. And that's what it was, because that's the brewing school he went to. Right. Uh, I mean, I, I guess he could have... If that's a cover up, it could be because he could have just been. But he doesn't. He not he didn't. Right. It could have been like I liked it because it was kind of like a, just enough of a riff off of Dupont that I liked. It, it certainly could have been. Right. Well, there's also things like if you don't make something that's significantly similar to that, then you didn't make a saison, right? If it's not phenolic, it's not. It's like arguably no longer a saison, right? But sure. So I don't know. I probably have hotter takes on that than than necessary for. Oh, what man. we're talking about riff, today. Riff. Uh I don't, I don't even know where why I brought that That's up. Fine. We don't have to riff. Okay. So, let's let's pull it back into something different. So, uh So, we were talking about like IPAification of things, how style just kind of uh well, uh man it is kind of both. I'm thinking, like, is style only to sell beer now? Is it? Jake, is style just a way to sell beer? Mm, I think it's a way to guide what you make, too. Um, for us, it is anyway. But, um, yeah, we take a look at styles um, as it relates to our portfolio, and um, there's a little bit of, yeah, that, that guides a little bit. Um, again, we make spins where we want to, but sometimes we like to just do the interpretation of the thing as, as close to like some kind of example that we can think of. But um, I, I think they're kind of intertwined, right? Um, yeah, you, you know, that's that's where we're at. But I know breweries kind of go both ways about it. Some people just kind of brew what they brew and let the cards kind of fall where they're going to fall. Um you know, I have a lot of respect for breweries that are just going to, like, brew one style of beer, just perfect it and call it a day. Um, but for us, it's it's a valuable tool in fleshing out um, a portfolio. But ultimately, yeah, that's it's, it's, it's a guidance for sales, and um, that's just kind of how we built our brewery over time. So it's a guidance. I, what's, up, what's up, Pat? I was going to say, I think it definitely goes beyond just being a selling tool in that, like, kind of like I was saying earlier, like, as American craft beer grew, you had proliferation of all of these different types of styles. And so you had all these people, people that now like have built some of the larger brands in the, in the U S that subscribe to this idea of beer styles to the point where like beer styles became sort of the vernacular of how people in the industry or people that like people that drink a lot of beer talk about beer. It's, it's a shorthand way so that you don't have to, give a long flavor description for every single beer you make. So like to Jake's point earlier, like when they're talking about making a new beer at Hopewell, 
they're going to start with like a, even if it's like going to be something totally removed from that style, like you were talking about Lupa Lager, it's like we have in our head what a West Coast IPA lager would be like, and that's kind of what we're going after. Like that's the starting point. And even for breweries, Mike, like you were saying with Pipeworks, where it started with a flavor description, like you're still cognizant of styles and kind of what they mean and are able to use them to talk about your beers. So I, mm-hmm. I do think that like at its core styles still serve a very valuable purpose as like almost a, a language in, in and of itself. They're, they're used as a communication tool. Now, sometimes that is co-opted or used for, marketing or selling purposes but i I do think that it still serves that very important purpose of helping people communicate yeah so when when is a style is there can a style be bullshit totally okay why and when can a style just be bullshit like what makes a, a a style bullshit versus trying to communicate to the uh, consumer? Yeah, what what you're what you're getting ready to to drink? I feel like that's kind of like oh, this is a question. For oh, Pat. sorry, just for Pat. A question for Pat. Yeah, and I'm I'm gonna let Slough jump in because I'm like, I think. Yeah, I think well, you I said totally. You said totally, and and I'm with you. Like I agree, but it's like you I, know, it's like. It's like porn, like you know that's when exa- you say that's exactly it, right. what I was gonna say. Where the, <laughs> there can be things that you can say about like th- how a brewery goes about putting a style on their beer that could be bullshit, right? And that becomes personal opinion, um, specifically when it's like this seems to be something that's just to drive sales. Then that seems kind of that has nothing to do with like what this style of beer actually means. But it just they know that if they call it that, it will sell better. Like. Uh, I don't know. The, lo- the lager version can be like of beer. can be like a everything being IPA. called a pilsner that has nothing to do with anything to do with a pilsner. But they know if they call it a pilsner, it will sell better than if they just call it a pale lager or something like that. Like that happens mm-hmm. a lot. And and I think the more specific, the more you talk to brewers of specific styles or specific worlds of beer, West Coast the, pilsner, the more like you the see one. like frustration in like I'm trying to use the vernacular or the language to articulate to people what my beers are and then someone else, you know, uses the same words that, but doesn't, you know, it doesn't have the same meaning behind it. It doesn't have the same, like they don't lager it for this, they don't do this to it. Like you see people get very specific about it. Uh, or it's just like, <laughs> sometimes they're not even fermented with lager yeast, but, or it's actually a hellas, but it sells better. It says it's a Pilsner. Like you see, but you have one that's a specific bugaboo of yours. Chris, why is Czech dark lager a bullshit style to you? Um, man, because that's one that's like, <laughs> is it, it, it a has the it style? has like people want make you know it's not milkshake IPA right? It's not a clear, obvious cash grab kind of feel to it. Uh, but you feel very strongly that it's a bullshit style. Well, do I? Do I feel very strongly? This is the impetus of this entire show. (laughs) This is the impetus of this entire show is a conversation about Czech Dark Lager and your frustration with it. Yes. Well, I think it is about how um, people want, I mean, that style sells. Mm -hmm. To a certain market, yes. To a certain market. To the beer temple. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think and, they're making voodoo Czech dark lager next year for. Yeah. <laughs> I think in 19 twos. Yeah. 19.2. Yeah. It's, it's 18% alcohol. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and it well, has raspberries I, so in it. So here's, here's something for you. Like, I would say. So, and this is going to be like almost too. I feel like this is the show for it. I was going to say this is like too nerdy for this to exist, but (laughs) welcome. So Czech Czech dark lager was not a style prior to the 2015 BJCP guidelines. And I, I'm not going to say that it is explicitly because of it being added as a style. But if you look at Czech dark lagers made like 10 years ago versus today, huge difference. And I think part of it is that there was 
this kind of source that people could look at and go, oh, that's a thing. I could try making that thing. And sort of like, I, I think it also happened that like, you know, we had growing popularity of more obscure lager styles was definitely something that drove the emergence of that the style. New, you know. And the fact but, that brewers were making more lagers and had more lager yeast that they needed to get their money's worth. <laughs> of. So, yeah, perhaps. Yeah. What do we? All right, we got one more pitch. What do we do? All right, let's make the dark one. But I really do think that without that style being lumped into the, like being included in the guidelines, that it may not have, there may not have been the discoveries that the, that there was. Uh, you know, you could say that maybe that's bullshit. Uh, you know, like I would point to on sort of the flip side of things like Goza was a style that like didn't exist in the market for all intents and purposes. It exists in 10, the world really. 10, 12 years ago. I mean, truly it like nobody was, there was like one obscure brand in Germany that was making it. And I kind of like Czech dark dis- lager. <laughs> I very distinctly remember when it kind of like blossomed into being. And like, I don't think anybody would argue at this point that Goza isn't a style. Or like, isn't a style worth? I don't know. No, like some people might be like, no, it's still a garbage style. But that's personal opinion. You know, I think Goza is super interesting when you talk about this type of stuff because Goza didn't was a popular style a very long time ago. Disappeared four hundred years ago. Dis- disappeared, came back as like a pure, you know, malt malt salt like bacteria, yeah. like uh, a pretty four ingredient, five ingredient beer. And then started going down this path of like just a bunch of stuff being added to it that wasn't really traditionally part of Goza's tradition. Not at all. And then well, almost more like. And then winter. also now when you see a Goza, it maybe has like key lime in it or something. But for more or less, Gozas aren't like the hyper fruited kettle sour. Like ke- fruited kettle sour broke off of Goza. Doesn't even have a style demarcation anymore. Goza or no super f- kettle soured fruited beer. Fruited kettle sour is just that's a style. It's just sour fruited right. sour right. kettle no. fruited kettle sour, right? Yeah. And so like it's interesting to watch this like watch a style watch, watch Goza drop off of something like that that as it marches towards just like let's just make it fruit juice uh, that didn't happen to milkshake IPA, right? The IPA stayed on milkshake IPA, mm-hmm. whereas like Goza didn't have the same. 30 years of brand ca- uh, brand cachet that it drove yeah. sales. People were just like, and I, I like the fruited one. So that, that what goes to stay in its little target of like, yeah, it's still, it's like a lightly salt, like salted kind of little tart thing that and sometimes we'll put like margarita esque flavors in because it already has a salt. That's, that's the sort of, that's why I paused when you're asking me about the Czech dark lager, because I think there are many instances, Goza maybe being one, uh, maybe uh, Belgian strong pale being another um, about Irish Irish yeah pills Pilsner I would almost put in its own category but like Irish dry stout um, uh, these are things that have like like been you know, they are singular beers that are after the fact I feel. Um, maybe not uh, Belgian Strong Pale, um, being like used to demarcate, we're trying to make this one beer. And I guess... Well, they won't let you use their names. They right. have little R's on them, little TM's. Right, exactly, like Citra. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and and maybe Guinness that is. Like, and then it's like, but if, if style is everything and can be anything, then it's also nothing. And that it's like the know it when I nice. see it thing. So it's like if if Ofleku is its own style because it's just a beer, uh, then like. But there's got I, I don't know well enough. There's no other I'm Czech sure there, brewers I'm that sure make a there dark are lager. Czech darks, but I think the archetype is pretty singular. Sure, but that's I, but that's every style. Definitionally, every style has an archetype. Boy, oh boy! I mean, maybe. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. Really? Uh, I that, don't know. Yeah. Really? Lambic. 
What's the archetype for Lambic? I mean, like Cantio or no, like, no way. What are you talking about? Every in every, in, Bel- in Belgium, they would not call Cantio the well, archetype for Lambic. Sure, but but well, I don't understand the argument for this one though. That that there because there is one iconic version of something, then it can't be a style. No, it's are singular. When there's one iconic, and there's like virtually no others, or any others have just kind of like sprung up to be like a copy or a facsimile of that beer. Right. Okay, that's so, what I mean. And we're saying that's Irish dry stout. That's what about a American, huge what about American pale ale? Uh, or is that just iterated so much that it's, you can't really say that anymore because there's been yeah. there's so many more hops. Yeah. So I that's would. just a point on the timeline then. And that could be, a, I mean, that could Maybe. be Czech Dark Lager. Right. Right. Maybe. Right. Exactly. That's kind of where I'm going is or like, on, where do you. On the road path to get out of bullshit land. Well, there's also like, I think with, with American Pale Ale, there were iterations constantly, and we have ki- kind of denoted one based on its iconic status and how good it is uh, versus like uh, there were so many Czech Dark Lagers, and this one has rose above to be a brew pub that n- and is obscure and, and brewers go to and revere, sure. which is Ufleku. Like, I mean, I mean, if, if Ufleku has been around since like the 1500s. Forever. Yeah, it's been so around forever. I, so I think that people hold it up just because it is like it's iconic and also it's in Prague. So it's like if you're going to the Czech Republic, it's easy to get. Um, and it's like a, it's a cool place to visit. Um, I I think that that's probably the reason that people hold that up. I know that there are other examples in the Czech Republic. I have not had any of them, but I, I know that there there are more than just that one beer. So I don't know. Right. Are they derivative of Ufleku or no? Are they their no own? No idea. Right. No okay. idea. Well, you should have had a definitive answer. This is the Beer Temple <laughs> podcast. Even if you didn't know, you should have stated. They absolutely it. are. Maybe, maybe derivative. Maybe de- A hundred percent, maybe derivative. So I've got a, I've got like a sort of like pivot into a different line of BS style. Yes. All right. And this and this might be this is probably an unpopular opinion. So I'm oh, feeling like I love is, it. I know. So I, I want to do a little thought experiment. I need everybody to go around and say, and I, you cannot be okay. influenced by your neighbors. What is a West Coast IPA? Mm. Chris. <laughs> He's just returned from the promised land. Bone dry, pale. Bitter. Hop Jake. forward. Um, uh, very aromatic um, on the citrusy, piney side, and um, a good deal of perceived bitterness. I don't draw that line at super dry. Mike? I mean, I, w- I-, I would say dry, pale. Uh, bitterness is present and a- somewhat aggressive, and... Citrus, pine, and a little dank. Maybe some OG onion garlic uh, present yeah. in those. And to me, I'd almost say like... As Actually, a, that's what I want from them at least. Right. I would almost say like a modern versus a classic. Like I described a classic. So what I would say is... A modern is way just fruitier, I would just go to Just go to Pizza Port and say, I want a classic IPA. And whatever they give you... Is a West Coast IPA. I mean, but the <laughs> real answer is an IPA brewed on the West Coast. That's the <laughs> right. real answer. I mean, that's that is that is a simple answer. It's the beer from Pilsen. It, it's it, it's one of those things where, like, I I definitely, you know, and I feel like I've caught my fair share of it here. Like, definitely, I feel like I used to feel more dogmatically about style guidelines, and I'm a little bit more like that, eh, whatever, at this point. But I do think that there's value in styles kind of being defined somewhere when people use them to label and communicate about their beers. And like West coast IPA is, is a descriptor that is not defined anywhere. And the ones that like the definitions that you guys gave were remarkably like pretty similar, but I definitely in other groups have had this conversation and have had them be a lot more different. Like 
I remember talking to a brewer on the West Coast about it, and I was like, what is West Coast IPA to you? And he was like, no crystal malt. That's like the most important thing. So it's got to be super pale. Was that somebody from Russian River who said that? It was not. It okay. was... Uh, They're all about... So Vinny apparently gave this talk about uh, crystal malt and how it 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 hinders shelf life because crystal malt oxidizes and, and this and that. And that some of these beers that in the heyday of West Coast IPA may have had some no longer do. So I'm going to call bullshit on this guy who brews them out there <laughs> and knows way more about the history I, and them the true as beer ever. Temple beer yeah, there you go. Uh, it was it was tom kelly from el segundo there you go perfect uh, um i know you guys still get requests for what is it broken skull ipa oh all the time yeah that's their beer <laughs> we love but, uh, uh, no crystal malt in that huh it, but it's one of those things where, and I, and I do think that today a lot of, I mean, I don't know if that's the definition that everybody subscribes to, but like, would you consider Lagunitas IPA to be a West Coast IPA? I haven't had that beer in forever. I mean, I, I think no like idea. definitively you have to put it in the category of a West Coast IPA, but to me, in the purest form, I would say it is kind of a... Uh, it's not the it's not the the red part of the bullseye. It's maybe just outside the green part of the bullseye. Well, it's one of those things where, like, at at one point, that would have been probably considered like a like a prototypical West Coast IPA. But at this point, you look at it and it's like it's it's verging on amber in color. It's got a reasonable amount of sweetness to it. Like, I think for most people, that wouldn't fit. Union like, Jack West too. Coast. Union Jack did used to. I, Union Jack has been lightened up. Union Jack had crystal malt in it, or had d- darker malts in it. No doubt about it. No doubt. Did they call that a West Coast IPA? I don't know, but it was I like think their a, intention a, was to make like a yeah I don't surfer know. bro. Well, West that's Coast an interesting IPA. point here, though, is that these breweries that have been around for a while started. They they're the ones kind of ushering in West Coast IPA, and they've changed their recipe over the years. So, what becomes the style then? Is it does it shift as they make those changes? Um, you know, I think that's a that's an open-ended question. I don't have the answer to that, but right. That's why you have to go back to Pizza Port, who hasn't <laughs> seemingly changed jack shit. So there's crystal malt in those beers? No, it never has been. Yeah. I mean, I, they were bone Pliny dry and pale. It's pale. Is it? It, it is it now. Is now. It okay, is now. so because there, there was a time that beer had like at least an orangish. Yeah. yeah, tint to it. Yeah, so, no, he's openly said that they've gone paler and paler. Okay, on so on right, yeah. and some of it is for shelf stability because yeah. of crystal malt doesn't age as well. Right. Um, but I so for me, I so to say I, it's I would definitive, say, I think is BS. Right. Because, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think like so when I'm thinking West Coast IPA, I do think of like the older school examples of like Lagunitas as being like definitely a part of that broader picture. I think. Um, yeah, I think West Coast IPA is, is, is for me, I, I define it fairly broadly. Um, yeah, clear, clean, but um, I, like I said, I think that dryness, like that can fluctuate in right. the malt character, but I think bitter. Yeah, bitterness for me is yeah. the bigger. And, and making it. it, I mean, t- to me again, it's uh, maybe I, I should, I'm making up my own style because I'm thinking of the, San Diego style yeah, West talk, Coast IPA, which still, even having just been there, is its own thing. We, still, now, oh yeah, we've which done, is amazing. We've we've had internal discussions where we've made a West Coast IPA. And we thought, um, well, let's actually zero in on the San Diego kind of interpretation of that. What's going on there in that particular scene at the moment? Um, so yeah, that's another kind of wrench in the whole thesis, right? Is that you're, the, as we brew these beers, it's it's in a moment in time, and that context changes and. The breweries themselves that originated these styles have changed um, those recipes. So, um, how does how does style um, can it evolve and still be meaningful? I don't know. It's it's a hard. Yeah. I mean, it can be meaningful. It, but yeah. I mean, it ha- it has to though. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, styles styles. To your point, styles are always and style descriptions are always a snapshot in time of what that style was like then. But and I think. Like, what, we, Sorry, I think what's interesting, not to cut you off, but I think what's interesting there no. is that we're we're more open to having that conversation as it regards, like, American styles. But when it regards, like, continental 
uh, European, um, you know, German, etc. cetera. Um, there seems to be way more like, no, it has to be this way, as if the breweries out there haven't been making those same changes as ingredients have shifted and evolved over time. I, I think it's a really interesting um, kind of aspect of, of brewing. No, honestly, I think it's a really important point in that, like, it, truly we do treat European styles a little bit more dogmatically in the U.S. I think just generally people do, but those styles too evolved. I, I can't remember. I have it somewhere. It's like a book called like Amber, Black, and Gold. Mm. It's about styles Martin in the Cornell, U.K. baby. It's it's about styles in the U.K. and it said something to the effect of I think it was mild that like every twenty to thirty years was like a totally different style for right. like two three hundred years. And, and so it's one of those things where, you know, we kind of look at the guidelines and, are, or some people do at least and are like, well, this is how these traditional styles have always been. It's like, no, you know, they maybe didn't change as fast as they do now. I think with sort of internet, social media, just much faster transmission of information that styles probably shift more rapidly today than they did a couple hundred years ago. But styles then were not a static thing. Like they're, they're a description of a group of beers as they currently exist in the market. And those are going to change over time to reflect what people enjoy drinking. I'm curious if in the past people were taking it like styles and just changing the names of them to sell better. And I've been a proponent of doing that in the past. I'm saying I like, don't call it a original bitter or whatever. Call it a, Pub ale. Sure. Um, and, and, but at the same time, it's like, what's the difference between, you know, uh, uh, I don't even know, like, uh, like um, Session IPA and uh, what are they calling them now? They're calling them something different now. The Session <laughs> IPAs are kind of, of done, done for, but the style still kind of exists those like lower ABV uh, IPAs or light, spite light, right? Spite light, right? Something like that. Or um, uh, I mean, there's there's a bunch. I mean, I think co- cold IPA, IPL, or is it cold IPA? Well, they're kind of the same effing thing. Or you certainly they're 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 you could certainly say like no no IPLs are more like this and cold IPAs are more like that but like they're close enough that you could have just been like well this is our interpretation now if Fuscos IPA is what it is now then IPL can be this a cold IPA. This brings us back to Ron Pattinson where you want to draw lines and how specific you want to be because like if what if if our version of Ron Pattinson two hundred years from now is like. Actually, the IPL was, uh, you know, this much more bitter and made in this region, whereas the West Coast IP, uh, uh, Pilsner was actually made in Southern California. Like, and then <laughs> sure. you're like, and IPL then was, was made the across the country and was in this year, and then the same style was made across the country and called this. Right. I mean, I think what he would say is the same style was essentially the name changed, is what he would say. Right. And I think that is because, what happened. Well then, especially because it when sells you better. Think about things like that. Is the goal to describe the marketing and sales of what happened or to try to get to what the liquid tasted like because then you're going to be in two different realms because anyone who's making an, an IPL now or who's making a cold IPA now is like, there's no, 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 this is, the, this is not an and IPL. And India Pale Lager is a total horseshit, terrible style name too. Yeah. So like, I'm right. not saying to use that. Like, ditch that thing. That you thing heard it here first. Chris wants you to be making more IPLs. Like it's, they, they make an IPL, send it to the beer India, temple. And they Chris both must have right. India Pale in them, though. It has to be. They, I, Chris, they I, have to have IP I, like the way like the KFC, cold is just KFC IP. Now. Yeah. I don't. IPA. I don't want to shut you down, Chris. But like telling people to ditch using IPL would have been a hot take like seven years ago. Like <laughs> it's, that ship has sailed. Cold IPA was the literal rebranding of a style. Like yeah, that's style, what that's it, exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, theoretically, well, they're made a little bit different, but I'm not going to be the pet in today. Right. Right. You can. This is the place for it. I but. mean, <laughs> IPAs are made different today, too. Right. Probably just as different as IPLs and cold IPAs, probably. I mean, there, there's been differences do, in that. Do we think the IPAification of all styles has, like, and I'm saying that obviously, pedant, uh, not pedantically, but uh, broadly, is that hurting or helping craft beer? 
is the fact that like so many things are being called IPA that have nothing to do with Voodoo Ooh. Ranger or whatever people what like, most think, people think IPA is. Is that hurting overall or helping craft beer? I think it's um, it's it's short sighted for sure in my in in my opinion. I think kind of how we approach Hopewell is um, that's kind of our thoughts about it. it, it like it's something you get the short-term gain of the bump in sales, but overall you're, um, I, I would argue you're weakening, um, weakening not only the category, but also just, um, beer in general, um, with that kind of flattening, um, of styles, I think. Um, but we kind of got pigeonholed into doing that. I think it's, it's not necessarily brewers faults for doing that. I think there's a lot of things that dictate, that flattening uh, and homogenization of, of what we call things. Um, that's just kind of like... Um, what, the love what, of the bottle caps. Well, it's just like, no, I think it's it's not even that. I think it's just like kind of what <laughs> brought, like more broad ex- exception or, uh, acceptance of craft beer um, across the country has led to. It just, um, you get kind of flattened by the market, right? Um, just like being out there versus like, oh, if you're a small little... Uh, entity just brewing your beer out of your front door and no one's you know bothering you you can kind of you can kind of get a little more esoteric but when you're out in the market you're selling beer on the shelves you're you're a lot more things are dictating um a lot more pressures right. out there um flattening and when there's ten, the thing, the, go ahead i was gonna say the thing is i don't think it's just a homogenization of what things are being called but like what's being made like i remember i think it was in 2019 going to a festival in toronto at collective arts and uh, the guy who put together the festival, he was like, he was like, you know, I've got like 50 of the best breweries in the world here. And I've got, and we got three beers. <laughs> right. It was all like, it was like, everybody had a hazy IPA, pastry stout and like something else. Yeah, man. And, and when you look at beer lists today, it's, it's kind of the same thing. And I think part of it is just, it, it's, it, it's partially just consumer pressure that that is what, a lot of people want, you know, there's a small segment of people that want, still want to have access to all of these different styles, but you're sort of like your bread and butter craft beer consumer is like looking for hazies and pastry styles. So I, I don't think it's a hundred percent. I know this, like the line has generally been like consumers are the ones dictating this, but I, I think we can't leave out like just big box stores and distributors who want to simplify. Oh, totally. And I think, it's like the thing with the algorithm on like Instagram, people say, Oh, it gets me so well. No, it's just flattening what they send you. And then over time, that's what you start to like. I think that's a huge (laughs) um, aspect of where beer has landed. Um, and, um, you know, again, I don't blame the brewers necessarily. It's, it's, you're kind of, um, effed on both sides of it. There's just all these external pressures, uh, dictating when you get to a certain size, especially, um, where you have to kind of, play by those rules or you're or you're just going to get washed away in the sea of of the competition especially with by players who are willing to play that game right that's the other uh, hard part about it is you can have a, a intention right. or like a we're, sim- we're looking for a cold ipa yeah well we have this uh lupo lager and right. it's, well we're really really looking for a cold ipa do you have <laughs> one we have this lupo lager and that's kind of our answer to well we really want a cold ipa do you have one yeah yeah it's a cold well, IPA. yeah I, like eventually you're just like yes yeah. that's what it is yeah i think there's hopefully also- not for us but I, I i yeah i hear your point i mean like we we had right not Mizar- literally but- yeah i mean like we for example we hedged on hazy ipa um for a while, um, we just didn't want to call things hazy IPA. We just wanted to say this is an IPA. It might happen to be hazy, and we just said, you know what? We 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 got off that um, high horse and um, accepted what it was. And um, you know, it does. We're, we're better for it as a as a brand in terms of you know um, the health of the business. But um, that's that's not a great example because I I think you know we made the right decision there. But there's other ways where I think you a good example of who you made the wrong decision. Yeah, I mean I think if like if we were deciding not to make, I mean there's one thing if we decide not to make that beer, but uh, that style at all. But but yeah, sorry, do you mean to keep going there? I think it's the, no, not at all. The fact that there's ten thousand breweries too, right? Where if you go to a brewery that isn't making those styles and that's what someone wants, we're like, well. It's not even like I can go down the street to the the bottle shop and get it. It's like I can go down the street to this other brewery and have basically a like a very similar experience, but get exactly the beer I already know I like. Yeah, like I was talking. To, I've talked to two breweries in the last month, probably neither of which make any sort of IPA, and they 
told me that they both have semi-regularly have customers come in, see there's no IPA, be like mad at them and be like, can I get an IPA? Like, no, we don't have any. And then leave. And so, I mean, like, <laughs> okay. I mean, like, that's okay. Yeah. But the fact that like there's, hey man, we, we, I mean, we, you and I, in a different situ- situation, could go into a, a brewery that only had double dry hopped and I was talking kettle to someone sours about this today, yeah, and I, do the same exact I was, thing. When I go places, so like that's legit. I mean, sure. like that that's fine, sure, because it's not not every restaurant is for every person, right? You know, so I think not every brewery needs to be for for every other person as well. And I think we would also to just like you know, kind of side with that guy. I think we would also be a little ticked if it was like all you have is double dry hopped and fruited sours. By the way, what the hell is going on in the other room? This is a Tuesday night. <laughs> J-Max is, must be getting in crushed. the getting crushed <laughs> right now. It is wild. So we there. may have to end It sounds this. like a like canned I'm gonna be, background I'm going to be like washing honest, glasses in like five minutes. Yeah, this is wild. It's going to be nuts. All right. Well, we'll They're see. probably all drinking hazy IPAs. I, too, I, I got up uh, and peeked through like the door uh, a moment ago. And there were two people making out like a foot from me because the door it's a typical was closed. Tuesday, right? And I was like, "What is happening?" Definitely a scene you expect to see at the Beer Temple on Tuesday. On yeah. a Tuesday. Well, they know we're, we're they know we're recording the pod, yeah. so they're like, "Well, we just we, we, we've got That's a the new after party for us out there. We've got a new milkshake cold IPA that we launched, so <laughs> double decocted. They're well. here for it. Yeah, it's it's well, it's triple decocted. Tri- Tec- oh shit! Technically, we only well, 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 no, no, you're fine. We only uh, advertised two of those, but there is technically a third decoction that is kind of off record. I did have <laughs> half jokingly tell Tom a Goldfinger he'd start putting DDC on his his <laughs> his loggers, <laughs> double decocted. I like it. Yeah, I don't think you should do it. So it's we've gotten nowhere with the style <laughs> conversation. I feel. Yeah. Really. I mean. Style's always changing, so let's have it again. I had told someone, someone asked me what the show was going to be. It's like, oh, this is going to be me venting about all the crap I hate. You refused then, to vent. And I just didn't <laughs> vent. Yeah. And so I'm still so pent up because there is so much BS a more time, style. Girl. I mean, I do feel like a lot of this stuff is just, you know, you throw IPA onto it and then you, you need do to it. do uh, like NFL films and just get you mic'd up and just like follow yeah. you a night of drinking and just like you stomping across the bar yelling about cold IPA or whatever the hell. Kicking people Wait, out of the bar. Is this your biggest pet peeve in beer right now? What? Is this your biggest like pet peeve in beer right now? The thing that like, gets your goat the most is this kind of like bullshitty style thing that you. Because we talk about it a lot actually. Uh. I don't know. I, I, the I what, is, no. Is like, the, my is biggest it? pet peeve is how people are just how styles or or I'm not going to blame it on it might be distributors, it might be the consumers, it might be the suppliers, it might be whatever. But it's just so much sheeple. Notice it's how he didn't so, say retailers. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it might be retailers. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I noticed you left that one out. <laughs> yeah, I, it's funny. I didn't even... <laughs> Couldn't be me. <laughs> it comes naturally to me. <laughs> Leaving myself out of blame just is like breathing to me. Yeah. Uh, but, but no, it's... That is my number one pet peeve, is like just the, the, the lack of apparent like, like cojones to like do something different. And it's getting better. It's really it's hard, getting, dude. It's getting better. <laughs> it's, it's really hard. It's getting better. It's, it's getting scary. better. It's getting better. It really, really is. It's not what and a financial reward is. I can tell you that. I'll also tell you that Chicago is ahead of the West Coast, from what I saw. Yeah. Uh, I know Andy Carter, uh, sorry, Dr. Lambic was on last week and was saying that you know you can get uh, a variety of styles and stuff like that. Right. I did well, not see that. I, I think also, like, t- not to dispute him, because he lives there, so he'll, he'll know better than us, but, like, when you ask people where should I That's go, never stopped us before. right, right. But you ask where should I go, they all told you to go to the best yeah. IPA breweries. Whereas if you, someone's going to Chicago and they're like, where should you go? You're like, oh, you should probably check out like Half Acre and then Dovetail and then like uh, Citra. yeah, like they're they're actually ours. Yeah. No, you should definitely come check out our alley at entrance. I would to definitely our- <laughs> would have said that if I had, wasn't staring at you as a while. Yeah, of course. Listing other places. Right. But it's like there is a, a wider breadth of, of actual producers here, I think. And, I, and 
if we're going to blame the consumer for some of the stuff about like making so much hazy IPA, we have to give credit to the Chicago consumer that like Hell breweries yeah. like this could exist. Like there was a time when it was like keeping together is was afterthought off color all existed in Chicago at the same time. And those were like, those would, would have been four of the top 20 Saison producers in America, according to craft beer and brewing magazine, right? which is, is nuts. amazing. All that, all within the, all surviving within like 10, 20 miles. Of right. Time. And then in, in, in California, Goldfinger, you have dovetail, like, let's just art say history all within in like Southern the California. Area. I'll say, uh, I went to green cheek, uh, uh, Beachwood, uh, Rip, um, uh, Mickelhenny. I went to um, North Park. Um, I went to, I don't know, many other places, uh, Society. Mad Fritz. No, 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 no. I'm just talking about like way <laughs> down there. Uh, right, right. Oh, I got you. Um, and they're all essentially brewing the same styles with slight iterations let's yeah. say i don't think you can name in chicago now i'm taking southwest southern california and chicago but what two breweries are like they're basically the same brewery but they're doing like you know they're I mean, the same brewery but of, they're of ones you would send people like beer tourism stuff prop they're I don't Maybe see it in Chicago. There's definitely like smaller scale people that are, are making very similar beers to other breweries in Chicago. Maybe like Phase Three and Hot Butcher, like maybe, right? Maybe, but I, I think know. the point is you can send people here um, to various breweries that are brewing world class styles across completely different. And they styles. all have their own yeah. kind of. They all have their perspective. own perspective, they're, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, their own they're approach. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think Chicago is actually a really strong market um, in that regard, and you know, I've been able to travel a little bit for work and just seeing outside markets and, and you know places that I go to that I used to like, you know, I still do that I revered back in the day about you know just like making the best stuff. But then I go out there now and I go, oh, I have I have like really well regarded breweries, and I go, oh wow, we're making not us specifically at Hopewell, but you know Chicago in general, you can. We're making just as good a beer as um, any of the other world class breweries around the country, in my opinion. I think, I think we're stacking up pretty pretty high. Um, and, and like, Chris, to your point about like styles in general, and like, I think the line that I like to draw of like whether or not it's a BS style, or in the sense of like um, how it's presented to people, is if is if it's if the style is presented in good faith. Um, by the brewer. I know that's like not something you're going to know, but it's something you can sense yeah, sometimes. You can I, sense, yeah. yeah. Um, and just like not being Born. cynically uh, employed. Like, you know, if someone's coming to the table with some real thought and intent and you might disagree with what they call the style, I'm still cool with that, I think. Um, and I know, again, that's like, it's not, you can't go black or white with it in a lot of those contexts, but um, that's kind of where I, I look at it. If I, if I feel like, if I get a sense that someone's just kind of taking something and, and um, you know, bastardizing it then that to me is like kind of where i call bs yeah and i think even like a singular style can be both bs or not bs depending on who's making it and how genuine their present presentation of it is there you go so it's basically i think to sum it up it's up to us for no it's, it's up to us for to decide whether it's bullshit or legit if you have a question Mostly about whether me, but style, i will also defer to you other three the lightning round sometimes. of styles if you have a question about exactly. if this if you're at a brewery and you have a question about them presenting the style of beer, is it bullshit or not? DM me. Who should they send it to? Me. Okay. Me. Uh, insiders at. Crap. If you don't get a reply, <laughs> then ask somebody else. <laughs> What's your phone number so they can? Yeah. No. No. You have to uh, DM me on like Instagram or something just, like that. Just yeah. send it to Just Miles. Who's that? Wait. Who's that? Never heard of him. Yeah. Exactly. Don't follow He's, him. Don't DM. But he likes Miles. Exactly. Just he or she. Yeah, they, they they will respond. It's not a, is it a mild question mark? Then no. Yes, exactly. If you get no response, it's not a mild. <laughs> uh, I think I we should get out of here. I I, I am getting a little nervous that J-Max poor J Max is just being destroyed right now <laughs> by these people who are making out next to the door. Um, but I do want to thank uh, the the crusher own. Mm-hmm. Uh, Saint Fahey. Uh, Santa Fahey. And uh, also, 
Uh, I hear there's a, some news in the the Fahey world. Uh, nope. No. Nope. Nope. <laughs> oh. Okay. No nope. news. News to be news forthcoming. Okay. Leave it at that. Okay. All right. I won't. I won't. I won't say anything. I won't say anything. Uh, uh, that's for the best. All right. Okay. That's fine. Uh, I'm going to be so confused. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Like, is Pat okay. pregnant? Right. Exactly. I mean, I don't know. It's... And uh, as he, as he, as he finishes flight. his third Allagash White. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, all my best to uh, to Avery, who uh, is is out there <laughs> w- with more. you. Yes, she is out here somewhere. Yes, she's somewhere. <laughs> so. e- uh. Eagerly awaiting making delicious saison. Oh, good, good. Um, and uh, to uh, uh, the Take family. Um, thank you, Chris. Yeah, Mike, as always, for having me. Serge, thank you for. Uh, very professionally working those fades and uh, editing out the uh, swears that were littered throughout this episode. Appreciate it. Liberally awesome. littered. Yes, yes. <laughs> and thanks to you, Mike. And thanks to you, Chris. Awesome. We'll be back in uh, in a week or so. I think we're talking, uh, we might be talking some Celsius. Oh, Celsius. A true style. Now we're talking real style the real style real volume storied style real volume we're talking about Stack pushing it high, let it fly, units. Baby. units units you know chris and i are about the units yeah that's what we're about ce's <laughs> ce's baby pipe fill and clearing the pipes cleaning the pipes and refilling as far as seltzer goes just filling it yeah <laughs> just filling it up letting it sit there well i don't know about that all right uh clean them pipes <laughs> um but we'll see. Maybe we're not going to talk about it. We also got Niall on online too, uh, so maybe he'll he'll be up there talk about <laughs> floor malting your own malt. We can go one way or the other. We can go about seltzer <laughs> or a, doing your own floor malting. Step on the same show. Why not? Let's have them together. They're probably floor malting. That'd be a good round table. They're probably floor malting White Claw, right? I think they are. Yeah. I actually, I I definitively know they are. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's the hottest take I've ever heard. No, no, that's not a hot take. I know that they are. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You can. That hot, you can hot put, truth, take then. that to the bank. <laughs> yeah, invest in that. Mark Anthony, four malts, all their own. All the malt. dextrose for their white club. Yeah, they four malt all their own dextrose. <laughs> all right, well, thank you guys so much. We will see you one way or another in another week. Uh, so long until then. Bye. Remember, this is what we wanted. Remember, this is what we said. To never be heard, seen, from again, 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 again. Remember this is what we wanted Remember this is what we said To never be heard and seen from again Again, again, again Remember this is what we wanted Remember this is what we said To never be heard and seen from again Again, again, again